Thank God for air conditioning. Yes. Praise the Lord. Feels like summer out there, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Glad you reminded me of that. Smiling face, 
And uh, you're about to see Beth Lynn smiling face very shortly. She uh, got a video of trying to get produced for that, for the kids kickoff. And uh, special uh, uh, series that are being done. Uh, Clay has, has chosen one that uh, Tim Tebow is the, the main person on, so people know him. We're going to be looking at all kinds of different things and talk about faith uh, one way or another. Uh, next Wednesday here, we will start uh, a series. It's a video-based series and then some discussion on uh, thriving in Babylon. Sometimes it feels like you're surrounded by everything that's against God. So how do we thrive in Babylon? And it's, it leans heavily on uh, scripture from Daniel, as you would expect. So uh, we'll be, hopefully it'll become less complicated. There's a lot of stuff on there, but we're going to help you filter that out. And uh, it's going to be a good, uh, good resource for us to have, not only for our church family, but to reach others as well. We have some prayer requests tonight and Mary, I wasn't sure if you were going to be here or not, so I printed out your email. I uh, sent it out to our email chain. I didn't get a chance to share it with the phone chain, but I will. Uh, Shirley Smith, Mary's cousin, has been moved to a, a personal care facility. Uh, they give her uh, not a long time to live, but we just need to ask the Lord just to do the miraculous. Amen? Amen. We've got to remember that tonight to pray for Shirley Smith and for her husband Tom, her daughter Brittany, and her mother Jean Mooney and other family members. So we're going to take a moment and pray for Shirley. And also, uh, Chris, Crystal, do you, do you know anything more about her grandfather? Uh, he oh, there was, she is. I thought yes, you were out. I'm here. Kids. Um, his surgery was supposed to be tomorrow, but they had to postpone it after they got more test results. Um, he has a lot of dental work that needs to be done because he has infections and stuff gotcha. before he actually gets his valve replaced. And they okay. did decide that they're going to do open heart surgery rather than go up through with the camera and stuff. Right. Uh, Beth, Beth Lynn, I mentioned her earlier. She's our children's ministries director. She's working hard organizing our uh, kickoff for the kids, like a kids carnival of faith, we're calling it, on June 13th, Saturday, out here in the parking lot. But she's also facing some surgery coming up very shortly, and uh, we want to lift uh, Beth in prayer. Remember? Yes? I spoke to Beth this afternoon, and um, it's still scheduled for the 9th. Is it? And um, <clears throat> It's going to be very expensive. Yeah. It's not just a yeah. Okay. Well, she's and organizing I, the event. She will not be here, obviously. So I've got clarification. I also spoke with Hartley. Okay. She met with a chemo doctor. They're going to start her chemo on the 15th of June. It will extend through September about every 21 days. Okay. She's in third stage. Okay. Yeah, uh, Arlene Schrader, uh, not, not the greatest diagnosis to have, but we want to continue to lift her in prayer. And well, look, yes, I don't want to be a weenie because people have told me it's no big deal, but I'm still nervous and apprehensive. I'll be having cataract surgery on Monday to me. Okay. Yep. It was went great for me. One of the best things I could almost see again after that. Uh, Brother Dan also had uh, um, my brains gone. Pancreatic pancreatitis. Pancreatitis. Anyway, inflamed pancreas. And then on top of that, he has an inflamed duodenum. So. Uh, He's in odd pain. He came for the men's prayer last night. And uh, just need to, to lift Brother Dan uh, for the Lord as well. And this stupid virus, right? We keep praying against it. And uh, eternity will only know, right? We'll only be able to tell in eternity uh, what was going on that we couldn't see during this whole thing. And uh, praying for calm in our nation right now as well. With, uh, 
with all the stuff that's going on. It seems like it's been one thing after another, yeah. and it's kind of testing the metal of, of uh, a lot of people. And we can, we can form very strong opinions through all of this, whether it's the virus, or whether it's the protests, or whether it's the, the, the rioting and the looting. We have very strong, we can form very strong opinions, and that's fine. Um, but sometimes you got to back up and put yourself in somebody else's shoes. When people are, are making rulings and, and uh, trying to do the best they can to, to keep people safe, uh, the people who are uh, the ones that have to make the decisions, obviously they're going to be criticized no matter what they do. We see that with our president, we see that with the governor, you see it everywhere. Um, and if, if the, the loudest critics were asked to help, sometimes they wouldn't. So we just need to just keep in mind that some of this stuff's brand new. When it comes to this looting, I mean, certainly it's against the law and it's, it's terrible that it's come to that. And, and I know that there's people that are probably paying people to do it and that's disgusting. But uh, we serve a big God. And we're to take these things to the Lord in prayer. And the last thing you want to do is to return insult for insult, to react in the same way. That solves no problem. But a lot of people don't feel that way. And it doesn't make them right. Uh, the people that are looting, it doesn't make them right. But it's where they're at. And for them, somehow it makes sense. So we just really need to pray that God changes hearts. We need some unity in this country. We know that Jesus is the great unifier, but it's nothing you can legislate. It's nothing you can force, right? It's simply offering a new life that, that Christ gives. And uh, from my perspective and from your perspective, why would you not want to live for Jesus, right? But there's so many people that have not found that yet. And we've got to be salt and light to figure out how we're going to reach these people, especially as we look at a, a time in our history and in our in our world where it seems like fewer and fewer people ever even give a second thought to God. Well, it stands, uh, the responsibility falls to us to figure out creative ways to reach these people. The gospel is still the same, it hasn't changed. Uh, but we can't expect people who have no background with Jesus to understand anything about them, can we? So it is a very difficult time to witness, it's a very difficult time to evangelize, but we're still called to do it. And the same Holy Spirit that equipped the early church will equip us. Amen? Amen. So we've got a lot to bring before the Lord tonight, but uh, are there any other any other needs or anything heavy on your heart that we can take to the Lord? Emily? Continue with Tony and Trenton, please. Okay. Well, Pastor, I had my doctor's appointment today with the family doctor for my cholesterol and all that, you know, blood pressure and whole nine yards. Well, the blood pressure in that life, they're trying to get that under control and it's still up and down, you know. Um, when I'm calm, I'm fine. But boy, when I get, you know, yeah. it don't work too good for me. Just don't turn on the news. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. 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 But um, anyhow, um, I guess it's been about two years ago, year and a half, um, they diagnosed me with sugar. And the last time I was, or the time before I was at the doctor's, that's when you could go in, she said to me, she said, uh, <clears throat> Patsy, she said, your sugar's doing good. Mm. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Uh, she put me on the metformin. So today, she go on the phone and she said, Patsy, she said, answer me a question. And I said, what's that? I didn't know what she was going to ask me. <laughs> and she said, what are you doing for your sugar? Eating everything in sight. <laughs> <laughs> and she started laughing. She said, are you serious? She said, what about your diet soda? And what about your fish to food? You know, is that big? You know, a deck of cards? <laughs> okay. <laughs> is that a no, she said? <laughs> well, 
yeah. <laughs> she said, your sugar's great. She said, I cannot believe this. She said, you are a good girl. He said, <laughs> she said, don't let Earl tell you any different. You are a good girl. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> She did, uh, she said about my cholesterol was up a little bit, yeah. but she said, you know, nothing, but she said she was totally amazed at the sugar. Huh. Mm -hmm. Well, good. And that, like she said, I just, and metformin is the only thing that I'm on with, mm -hmm. as of right now. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and that's been like, at least yeah. two years ago. Yeah, good. Awesome. But, yeah. I mean, I'm not lying to anybody. <laughs> I've got Regular show or regular soda here. Yeah, just you know. I mean, I. So. Okay. I don't know. I hope God stays with me. That doesn't matter. There you go. That's funny. Well, but poor Earl, he's he suffered with his eyes. He's got to go and have. Uh, well, he had the cataract surgery, and then he had to. Uh, for the retina surgery, mm -hmm. on both the eye. Yeah. Well, he can't get that glaucoma down. Worth a darn. Mm -hmm. So now he's going for laser surgery again mm -hmm. on this. They're gonna burn the holes, you know, yeah. both the eyes. They're gonna do the one and they're gonna do the other one. But I worry about him with that. Yeah. Sure. Well, let's let's yeah. just give it to the Lord. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Anybody have some good news? I mean, besides the short We're here. We're here, right? Yeah, we're here. We got up this morning. Yeah. My next door neighbor brought me a very big piece of strawberry rhubarb. Oh, boy. I was happy. Next time, ask if he's going to bring it up for everybody. Yeah. All right. Let's let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you and praise you and honor you. Lord, that we can get together like this. I'm thankful for your church, and I'm thankful for this just this group of people right here tonight, that, that we, we come together and we celebrate and we sing and we look into your word. And Father God, I, I thank you for all the miracles that are represented here. I thank you for the favor that is represented in this room. But Lord, I thank you for just keeping us. We just honor you and praise you lift you up because you are worthy to be praised. Father, thank you for, for healing. Thank you for provision. And Lord, tonight we do come before you with some needs in our heart that are, are weighing us down. Shirley Smith, Lord, the doctors say six months and we know that you are the God that heals us. So Father, we just lift Shirley to you tonight. We ask that you would touch and restore and regenerate. Lord, the one that knit her in, in into being in the first place and just recreate what needs to be recreated. Father, be with her family, Lord, both extended and close, and just encourage them. Father, we, we lift Joseph up to you tonight as we've been praying as he's facing this heart valve surgery. Lord, I pray that you'll keep him safe and get through this other, other dental work that he has to have done before he can go into that. Lord, let's just keep him, keep him strong, keep his spirits up. And Lord, we also bring Beth before you tonight. She's had so much pain and so much struggle. And Lord, she has a schedule, uh, a surgery schedule. Lord, I pray that you would just give her peace as she faces that. And Lord, just begin to work right now in her body. Just begin this healing process, Lord. It would be to your honor and to your glory. Thank you, Lord. Lord, for Brother Dan, who's facing all these uh, itises uh, in his body, Lord, touch and heal, I pray. In Jesus' name, Lord, just restore him to health. Lord, for Arlene Schrader, Lord, we lift her up to you again tonight, believing that you are the one that can heal her instantly. You can you can just touch that body and recreate. Father, I ask that you would do that for Arlene tonight. Lord, be with Bill as he's walking through this with her as well. I thank you, Lord, <clears throat> that we are coming back together. I thank you that the virus cases are down. And, Lord, we just stand against that dreaded uh, virus in Jesus' name and command it to go. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you for the people that have recovered. Lord, we give you honor and praise for that. Lord, the protests and the violence and 
uh, the, the picking sides and the pitting one against the other and, and one throws a rock, the other throws a brick and the other shoots, it just seems to escalate. Father, I pray that your peace would just be over all that is going on. That, that, that we would be able to reason together. That there could be some dialogue together. Reasonable people. Not trying to kill one another. Not destroying things. But Father, I pray for those of us who really have not experienced uh, the, the uh, uh, so many of us here have had a pretty favorable life. So many of us here have not experienced racism. We've not experienced uh, people putting us in a category that we don't belong in. So Lord, help us to be understanding. I pray for an honest dialogue. I pray for us to be able to look at other people the way that you see them. Father, for Emily, Lord, as she's facing cataract surgery, I, get, I pray that you give her peace and that you would just guide the doctor's hands and she could have that restored vision. And once again, we lift Tony up to you tonight and we lift Trenton up to you tonight. You are the God that heals us, Lord. Just touch those bodies in Jesus' name. Thank you for the good report from Patsy. Lord, and the, uh, that her sugar is doing well. I pray, Father, that the, the other issue with cholesterol can be solved, perhaps just died or whatever it is, that that would come down. And Lord, we also lift Earl up to you tonight as he's going under the laser again for his eyes. Touch those eyes, Lord Jesus. Touch in Jesus' name and give him clear vision. Father, we honor you. We love you. We adore you. And we praise you that we get to look into your word. I'm thankful that your word is alive, that every time we read it, we see something new, that it's powerful, that it's the very word of God. Father, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We do some singing. I got a, a, kind of a mini system, but I think it's going to work. We're going to give it a try, okay? I didn't want to set the whole thing up.
in there or wherever we're at, he's welcome where two or three are gathered. Amen. Great hymn of the church, blessed assurance. things like 
riots, demonstrations, race relations, COVID-19, uh, authority, questioning of authority, self-appointed experts, and then more self-appointed experts. Think about what is our immediate response to all the things we've gone through so far this year. What's the long-term response? We have to make sure we're on the right side of things, and that's God's side. I didn't really plan this study of 1 Peter thinking how it coincided, but it really does. Of course, I had no way of knowing uh, the riots and everything that were going to be happening. And as we were finishing up the study of 1 Peter, like chapter 5, and it really is kind of a summary, and that's what we'll, we'll try to do as we go through this. Because really, Peter's writing to Christians in, in uh, Asia Minor, present-day Western Turkey, who are wondering, what's going on? Our world is changing. Um, these people that are in charge over us, which would have been the Roman Empire, man, they're getting really nasty. What should we do, Peter? Peter, of course, at this time is uh, a little bit older, and he is uh, probably the highest ranking person in the new church. Church had only been in existence for about 30 years. And he summarizes the end of this letter, and he really is saying, in the summary, he's saying, in light of current events, now what is your response to all these things that are going on? He, he kind of summarizes this whole thing and says, with all that we know, uh, with persecu persecution rising, Nero was the emperor, he was insane, and he would really, really be persecuting Christians. With all that we know about that and the authority that's being questioned, because that's some of the stuff we talked about, right? How, what should our response be to our civil leaders, uh, the authority in the home, whether that be between um, a master and household employee, or whether it be with a husband as the head of the home. How do we handle this authority? And what about submission? How are we to submit? Who are we to submit to? Well, we learned that Peter told them, you're to submit to your governing authorities. You don't have to agree with them, but God has allowed them to be there. And that's really hard for Americans to do, especially, right? And, you know, I don't take great joy sometimes in thinking I've got to, but, the Bible's pretty clear in several places that we're to respect our governing authorities. Uh, those who were called slaves, in this case, uh, it's not doulos, the Greek, it's a, it's a word that means household servant. Uh, they were of a lower class. Well, what about masters that weren't believers and treated them harshly? And Peter told them, listen, you have to, you have to do a, a good day's work. You have to do what you're supposed to do. They are in authority over you. So I think it's interesting that he wraps up this whole letter that we call the book of 1 Peter with some advice. And he's giving advice to those in the church as to how they should lead and uh, how they should make sure that those under their care are keeping the advice or following the advice that Peter's been given them. So we're going to go this, some of it will be a half a verse at a time, some a verse at a time. Uh, I'm using the New Living Translation tonight. Uh, you can compare that with whatever flavor you happen to have. But uh, we're going to start here at verse 1 uh, of chapter 5, 1 Peter. And now a word to you who are elders in the churches. Well, the word elder started out meaning age. You know, that one who has been on planet Earth longer. One who has experienced more. We do well to learn from our elders, right? Uh, Melody tells me that all the time. She's four months older than I am, so. <laughs> and, of, and of course, I do respect her. Eye rolls and all. But by this time, it really had come also to be an office within the church, an elder. We might call them pastors or bishops, but the, the word is presbyteros, uh, the, the Greek word from where we get presbyter. Uh, I have a presbyter. Uh, 
who is down in Waynesboro, and he is kind of my pastor, and uh, Dwan Newsom. And then there's a, a someone over him who is our district superintendent. We don't use the term bishops, but it's about the same thing, overseer. He's saying, now to those of you in the churches who are overseers of the flock, those who are responsible for the care of these people, so he addresses them, he says, I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. I mean, wouldn't it be cool to have the Apostle Peter addressing you tonight? You know, someone who walked with Jesus, someone who could say, you tell us all that, you know, I'm sure he had a lot of regrets, the things that came out of his mouth, the things that he did, he denied Christ and all of that. But he also could say, I, I was there and, and I was with him and, and I saw, and then Jesus restored me even after I denied him. And that's what these, you can just imagine these young Christians. I mean, this is Peter, right? So they, they and he humbles himself and says, I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings. He's a fellow elder, is what he's saying. He's not trying to elevate himself. And he goes on, and I too will share in his glory when he is revealed to the whole world. As a fellow elder, I appeal to you. So he's placing himself on the same level and says, listen, uh, he's kind of saying, I kind of know what I'm talking about, but he's not lording it over them. And he gives them some advice. And the first thing he says starts at the beginning of verse 2. He says, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you're eager to serve God. Do you think maybe when Peter was writing this letter or having it, uh, having it written uh, by Silas, that when he says, care for the flock, do you think maybe he thought of Jesus' words to him? When he said, do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep. He says, lead for the right reasons. I think sometimes the best leaders are ones who, didn't want, who don't want to be leaders. That they are called into it. Sometimes those who set out to be over other people or be a leader don't make the best leaders. And he's saying, don't don't do this for any any of your own uh, gain. Check your motives. And he says, don't lead out of duty. Don't be don't lead simply because nobody else will. But do it because you want to do it. And don't do it for what you're going to get out of it. And that can be money, or that could be just position, right? I mean, that must have started already, if Peter has to mention it. There must have been people even in the early church, you know? Buy my book. <laughs> Didn't have TV then, or internet. But it says you, you need to serve as a willing servant of God. So, to go back a little bit, and think about what I mentioned before, and what we studied in the previous chapters. When he told them about household authority, those who were servants, and how they should respond to their masters. Uh, he spoke about uh, husbands and wives. It was not in a rule over type of thing, especially us guys, you know. Guys can take that little verse out of context. And, Women, oh wives, obey your husband. That's right. But we miss the point that we are to give ourselves for our wives, right? Just as Christ for the church. It's not in Peter's writing, but it's in Paul's. So the, the attitude of being responsible for others, the attitude of having authority over others, is not where you lord it over them. You're doing it for the right reasons. And he is encouraging those who lead churches to have that same attitude. As a matter of fact, he goes on and explains that in verse 3. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. And the best example is Jesus, right? A lot of times I'll say here, you know, when we go out the doors, represent Jesus well. We need to represent Jesus well in everything that we do. And, and really, 
Peter's kind of saying that to these elders in these churches. That's, we represent Jesus well, not just inside the walls of a church building, which they wouldn't have had back then, but in our home, in our family, in our church, and in our community. Represent Jesus well. Verse 4 says, And when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. We're going to have all eternity to enjoy our reward for this. If God has you lead within this local church, that, that should that's an all that's an awe-inspiring thought. That God has placed you in a position of leadership, whatever that is. I'm I'm blown away every day at that. I really am. Um, I'll tell you this. Sometimes I wonder whether I should or not. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I might have shared it with some of you when I was, it was three different interviews, different levels of credentialing when I was being interviewed for my life. One gentleman who I was sitting across the table from that was asking me questions, he said, uh, he said, I serve a wonderful church. I wake up every day hoping they don't find out who I really am. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, obviously they thought very highly of him. And you folks have been very gracious to me. But it's, it's a, the responsibility is sobering. And it also makes you realize the, the importance of the role, but whatever you're leading it is, whatever your responsibilities are, uh, it's humbling too that uh, this is serious stuff that we do here. Verse 5 says, In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. And all of you, dress yourselves in humility. That doesn't mean what you wear. That's a, you know, using an illustration. Dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The younger need to learn from the older. And uh, I've learned an awful lot from people just listening to them tell stories. Uh, we really need mentors. We need, everyone needs a mentor, no matter if you're 93. You can still use a mentor. Uh, I think about uh, the, the, one of my mentors as I was going into pastoral ministry and how much I appreciated his insight and what he had to share. Uh, Years and experience bring wisdom. And sometimes we figure out what not to do, right? And they can be valuable lessons to pass on. Uh, Peter here is, is paraphrasing Proverbs 3, 34, when he says, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Verse 6 says, So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time he will lift you up in honor. Don't worry about writing your own press release. Let the Lord do it. In the right time, He will do it. You know, this echoes the words of Jesus in uh, Luke. Does someone want to look up Luke chapter 14, verse 11? Luke chapter 14, verse 11. And just uh, give me the high sign when you're ready to read it, somebody. Okay, Emily? <laughs> I had 14, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Yeah. Better off to humble yourself than to let God humble you. A uh, story about the old preacher, and uh, was mentoring the young preacher, and the young preacher thought he had it all figured out. And one Sunday morning, he finally got his chance to preach, and he got up in the pulpit, and he just thought he was something else. And he started off with his best illustration, and then after a while, he got lost. And by the time he was done, he, he hung his head in shame when he went to sit down. And the preacher said, if you'd have gone up like you came down, you could have come down like you went up. <laughs> yeah. 
And then the verse that we quote so many times, it sounds a little different in the New Living Translation, but verse 7, Give all your worries and cares to God, for He cares about you. A lot of you learned that in the King Jimmy that says, Casting all of your care upon Him, for He cares for you. The, the word care is really anxiety. Some of the, the translations will put it that way. Casting your anxiety. And I don't remember where it is. I think it's in the scripture where it says, uh, don't worry about what you eat in uh, Matthew 6. Matter of fact, let's look that up. Matthew 6, 31 to 34. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. It talks about anxiety. Jesus had a lot to say about worry. Mainly, he said, don't. He didn't say, we talked about this last night too. He didn't say, try not to. He said, don't. Matthew 6, 31 to 34. I have a volunteer. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all of these things, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But first, seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Yeah. I, I had forgotten that that's the passage and I had it written down here, but I was thinking of yeah. it's that passage where the, the word, and I can't get the Greek right, but the word that's used for worry there, it's, it's meterism or something like that, and one of the definition of it is to be suspended in midair, and I, I love that when you think about that. When you're worried, you're suspended in midair, you can't get any traction, you can't you can't do anything. That's, doesn't that describe how we feel sometimes when you're just worrying about something? To be suspended in midair. And, and Jesus said, and Peter said, don't. Don't do it. Cast all your care upon him. Because he cares for you. This comes back to faith, doesn't it? If we really believe that God is loving and he cares for us, and if we really believe what he has told us in his word, then we need to walk according to that. And that's faith. It's not faith in somebody else's opinion. It's not faith in the government. It's not faith, in, but it's faith in the Word of God. Most people who worry all their lives are not feasting on the Word. It's just not. Um, we had, I say it all the time, we have all these wonderful translations and study guides. Most of it is free or next to free if you're online. And there's really no, re no reason not to, except that you just simply have to, you have to make the effort. But once you get started, you find out it just makes you hungrier and hungrier. Cast all your worries, cares to God, for He cares for you. Romans 8, 28. Somebody know that off the top of their head? All things all work together. All things work together for good to them who love the Lord. That's right. All doesn't mean all things are good, does it? It doesn't say that all things are good. It just says that all, bless you, it just says that all things work together for good to those who are called or to purpose. And uh, you know what? Sometimes we have to go through some nasty stuff. But man, if you keep trusting him and have faith that he's going to do what he said he's going to do, you come out the other side of that running some lessons. You come out with maybe a few wrinkles in your brow, but you come out a little bit wiser. And you come out a little bit more faith-filled because he has brought you through here. So when you face the next thing, you're more likely to say, here I go. You know, my life's been like that all my life. And I've been blessed. And I'm, I don't, hey, I've never had to get off drugs and alcohol. I've, I've married to one woman. And we have wonderful kids. And, and I've got all these uh, favor of God many times in my life. But I've also learn how to do a lot of different things and I put myself in situations that I'm uncomfortable in only because way, way back I learned that you go ahead and you know he's going to be faithful. I don't say that for any kind of whatever. I'm just saying I've been blessed to learn how to do a lot of different things only because I 
At one point, I was scared to death, and I saw that he carried me through. I don't want to stand before God, right, someday, and have him say, you're my child and I love you, but then you should have missed out on what I wanted you to do. <laughs> right? I don't do that. I don't do that. I hope you don't either. Uh, verse 8 here, it says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So stay alert. Look out. Don't just accept everything that comes down the pike. It could be your enemy. And most of all, don't get lazy about it. Stay alert. Stay alert. Watch out. How should we stay alert? How, how do you stay alert for the enemy? What do you think? Just some thoughts. Stay in the word. Stay in his word. Pray. 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 Talk to him, right? Get to know him. Hang out with the right people. Got a good crowd here. It's like the uh, the counter the illustration. I love it. Um, I've used it before here, and I'll use it some more. I'm sure. The counterfeit expert. They asked the counterfeit expert. I bet you look at a lot of counterfeit. He said, "No, I just study the real thing." And then the counterfeit stands right up. And if you study the real thing, right, then you'll know what's coming down the pipe. Our enemy is sneaky. He is the destroyer. John 10.10 10 says that he is the thief, right? He comes to steal and destroy. But there's another part to that verse when Jesus said, I've come to give life and that abundantly. Yeah. Huh? So he's sneaky and he's trying to trip us up, but he doesn't have near as much power as a lot of people yeah. want to give him. We have authority in Jesus' name. Verse 9 continues. says, stand firm against him. And be strong in your faith. There's that word, faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering that you are. And church, hear this tonight. Hebrews 11.1, 1, I probably will cover that Sunday morning. I'm not sure yet, but it's our definition of faith, right? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Can I read the complete Jewish Bible? If you've never looked at that, Fascinating read. Complete Jewish Bible translates this. Trusting is being confident of what we hope for. Convinced about things we do not see. Man, that's good. Trusting. Every place that says faith, they use the word trusting. And think about it. If you trust someone, you have faith in them, right? So you trust Jesus. Trusting is being confident of what we hope for. We don't see it. We can't touch it. It's not here yet. Uh, convinced about things we do not see. We're convinced that we're saved. We, we can't. We don't. Aside from the inner witness of the Spirit, can you see your salvation? No, it's something that by faith we're trusting in Christ. We will see our salvation in eternity when we spend eternity with Him and not in hell, right? That's when the fullness of our salvation. So it's by faith. So everything we do is by faith. And, and he says, Peter's telling these people, Listen, if it's any comfort, you're not the only ones in this boat. He's saying that the church everywhere, Christians everywhere, that would have been the Roman Empire, which was pretty big, are being persecuted. You're not the only ones. Uh, and, and you're just going to have to stand firm. Verse 10 says, In His kindness, God called you to share in His eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. Which, by the way, some translations translate that us has called us to share, and that's okay. But the, the literal translation should be you. It's that personal. He is telling them that you, in your situation, he has called you, the people that are being persecuted, the people that are, are having anxiety, he has called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus so after you've suffered a little while, and that could be in length of time or in severity, after you've suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. He's going to complete what is lacking. And that's something we can grab a hold of today. No matter where you're at and what you're going through and what you're facing, the faith that you have for today, that if you, if you stay 
firm and stand firm, he will supply the faith that you think you're lacking if you just stand firm. Faith grows when exercised. And verse 11, all power to him forever. Amen. I mean, this only happens by God's power. None of this is possible on our own. We, we can, on our own, without God, accomplish some pretty impressive things simply because we're creations of God. But only as a child of God, uh, indwelled by His Holy Spirit, and, and that's one that stays in touch with Him, can we overcome these kind of obstacles. Uh, and it only happens by His power. Well, then we get to the very end here, and... Peter is giving his final greetings. He does write another letter, which under normal conditions we might follow and just do 2 Peter, but maybe we'll do that later. I really want to get into a, the, the series on faith. 2 Peter, by the way, is more about false, uh, looking out for false teachers, and uh, it's a short letter. I encourage you certainly to read it on your own. But uh, Peter's final greetings here, uh, verse 12, I have written and sent this short letter to you with the help of Silas, whom I commend to you as a faithful brother. My purpose in writing is to encourage you and assure you that what you are experiencing is truly part of God's grace for you. Stand firm in this grace. We well, mentioned Silas, other translations, Silvanus would be his Greek name uh, it's used, and we believe it's, it's the same Silas that was a partner with Paul the Apostle on his second and third missionary journeys. Uh, Silas delivered this letter to the church, and a lot of people think that he was the scribe, that Peter uh, told uh, Silas what he wanted to write, and Silas uh, wrote it down. Uh, it's noticeable in the, the uh, difference between First and Second Peter. First Peter is written more eloquently. Second Peter is written with more basic uh, in the Greek anyway. So he probably wrote this as Peter dictated it and helped him write this letter, but he definitely delivered this letter. Uh, and he says in this final greeting, <laughs> God's got this. God's got this. This is not catching God by surprise. This is all part of God's grace and God's plan. Just stand firm. You know, when you get right down to it, what's the worst the world can do to us? What's the worst they can do? Kill you? Kill us. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh? <laughs> and then he, he goes on in verse 13 and says, Your sister church here in Babylon sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Uh, the word church does not appear, but uh, a lot of people struggle over what this means. Some think it is literally a woman, your sister, um, and think that maybe it was Peter's wife, because we already know that Peter had a wife she traveled with them and everything uh, doesn't I don't know some translations say those are the co-elect uh, the believers with you not anything to get too upset about and he's just saying that look everyone here sends the greetings but he says Babylon uh, now discussion over that it, it seems unlikely that Peter was actually in Babylon when he wrote this and a lot of folks think that was kind of a terminology for Rome because Rome was a lot the same in its culture as Babylon was, persecution. Uh, Mark was likely John Mark, who would have accompanied uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. Uh, likely, is, when he says son, it's a son in the faith. Then he finishes up, greet each other with a kiss of love. Be with all, peace be with all of you who are in Christ. Obviously, at that time, the common thing would have been to greet one another with a kiss. And he says, peace. There was a song 30, 40 years ago, peace in the midst of the storm. And they certainly were going through a storm. But the very last thing that Peter wishes for them is peace in the midst of this. And it's, it's interesting. Uh, honestly, I, I did not select the study for next week based upon that word Babylon. It just happens to be in the title. But... I think it's a good way for us to continue this thought and move into how we live out our lives, how we walk our faith out. And I'm going to show you a little uh, clip, a little intro in just a minute for this study. 
If you have the Right Now Media app, uh, as of tomorrow morning, it'll be available. You can go on and watch the whole thing. Um, we'll. Uh, it's, it's available now. So I clicked on it today. The Thriving in Babylon. The what? The Thriving in Babylon. Yeah. Yeah, it's on now. But is is it on our page? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I had it turned off. It was not oh, supposed to well, be. I, I, it was our page. I clicked on it. Maybe okay. it's not, but I know I could, I've watched it. Okay. Anyway, it's on there. It's on there. <laughs> go on it and go down where it says First Assembly of God, and it'll have uh, a channel called Adult or Wednesday Bible Studies. I forget what it's called. But anyway, so we'll be going through that and having some discussion about it. I think it'll be really good. Uh, the idea is just like the study of First Peter was we found out what it meant to them. What do we take from it today? So does anybody have any comments or input before? We uh, show this little short video clip. Okay. Well, let's let's do this. Let's pray first, and then we'll let this thing roll. I'll give you a little taste of the study we're going to start next week. And and yes, Leo, you will have printouts uh, to follow. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, let's just thank the Lord for His goodness. Can we do that? Thank you, Father. You are so good to us. Lord, we love you so much. I'm so thankful that your word is so current. Even that something that was written thousands of years ago, or almost 2,000 years ago, Lord, and it, it applies to our lives today because you are the God of past, present, future. You're the God of right now. You haven't changed. You love us. Your grace is just so... Uh, in abundance in our lives and in our midst. Father, we thank you for every single one here. Lord, our hearts break for those who are trying to find our way through life without Jesus. Our hearts break for those who are trying everything they can to be happy and just never seem to find the right thing. Lord, I pray that you would give us your creativity and how we can reach out, uh, sometimes with a kind action or a kind word or something, Lord, that they can see something different in us. Father, I pray as we leave this place and go through our lives, daily lives tomorrow, that you will just put in front of us open doors of opportunity, that we may just share the love of Jesus in a world that it seems to be so hateful and spiteful and uh, so vengeful. Father, help us to represent Jesus well in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Uh, Larry Osborne is a pastor of North Coast Church in Vista, California, and he is the one that is going to be teaching this series, uh, and uh, I think it'll be good. I went through a lot of it today, and it's called Thriving in Babylon, and here's just a little sample of what we'll study. The world is in complete turmoil. We're dealing with a lot of stuff. Racism, poverty-stricken areas. Broken families. Sex trafficking. It's so violent now. Perversion. It takes everything out of God's divine order. I became very depressed. And I was going to take my life. And I said, God, I give you one more chance. And I said, God, please show me that you care. He went to back up a fellow officer and a group of gang members fired upon them and Dan was hit. And he died there. I didn't understand, what about all those verses where it says, He will lift you up? So I was yelling out to God. As an educator, my heart is for my students. There are rules or even constraints on what I'm able to share. It's difficult to weigh the balance of what, what's appropriate. I kind of made fun of Christians. I thought they were shallow. I thought uh, religion was a crutch that people used to get through life. Life is pretty fragile. That in itself made me want to live more for Christ because I don't know how much I've got. I don't want to waste a day. I got to a place in my faith that I had to be obedient to the Lord and I was taking a huge risk of people condemning me in my business. These are incredibly confusing times. It's as if we went to sleep and woke up in a completely different world. It leaves us, many of us, feeling confused, uh, uh, disoriented. We, we, we don't quite know how to respond to this place we find ourselves in. And yet, comes to a rescue a guy named Daniel, and a book called Daniel. 
It was written to give instructions to adults who were living in a Babylon-like culture so we would know how to have an impact and how to have an influence. What was his secret? God is always in control of who's in control. He's never confused, he's never frustrated, he's never surprised, and therein lies the foundational cornerstone of Daniel's attitude, Daniel's action, Daniel's survival, and Daniel's thriving in Babylon. So if we were writing a letter to somebody that we knew, we'd say, those of us here in Babylon, sometimes we look around and it seems like that, say anything but God, you know. So I think this would be a good study as we uh, come together. So God bless you all. If you're so motivated to get, that's the official paper conference <laughs> <laughs>